I am very happy uh, to announce today's lecture. We have a very interesting um, person amongst us today, Sabi Ahmed. Um, uh, the uh, basically just I, I'll give you a very short introduction um, uh, uh, on Sabi today, uh, uh, and then kind of invite him on the mic. Um, so Sabi Ahmed is a researcher at Asia Art Archive. Um, he has led various research initiatives pertaining to modern and contemporary art in India that include digitization of pro dig digitization projects of artist archives, uh, creating digital uh, bibliographies of vernacular art writing and organizing uh, conferences and workshops. In 2016, uh, uh, Sabi worked as a member of the Curatorial Collegiate of the 11 Shanghai Biennale curated by the Rux Media Collective. Uh, he is based in New Delhi where he has been a visiting faculty at the Ambedkar University's School of Culture and Creative Expression. And uh, Sabi is uh, going to talk to us uh, about, uh, about uh, archiving practices and his uh, talk is titled What Does the Revolt of Sediments Look Like? Uh, and he is primarily going to refer to his notes from the uh, uh, Shanghai Biennale, uh, 11 Shanghai Biennale which he was also a part of. So uh, welcome Sabi. And uh, thank you. Thank you for joining. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, Anush, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm very grateful all of you made it on such a rainy day. It could have easily prevented you all from coming, and uh, I'm delighted to have a big audience to share some of the stuff I've been doing in the past few uh, years. Uh, what I'm going to be doing today is uh, to read out parts of the paper and then speak impromptu and then maybe read out a bit again. So please bear with me. Now, almost two decades ago, am I audible to everyone? Yes? Okay, and if I, no? Yes, no? Better? Okay. Um, and if I go too fast, please um, stop me and ask me to slow down, yeah? Okay, so uh, almost two decades ago, in the year 1998, at a conference on landscape perspectives in Palestine held in Birzeit University in the West Bank, one of the most renowned post-colonial thinkers, Edward Said, had delivered a keynote lecture titled Palestine, Memory, Invention, and Space, where he noted a burgeoning interest he perceived in two broad areas of the humanities and social sciences, namely memory and geography. The paper was a meditation on geopolitics, where in which both memory and place were seen no more as sources of experiences and context to excavate, but as sites constantly being invented and pasts constantly being invented for political gains. The paper was about how nations keep inventing or producing their pasts as a way to justify new regimes of power over history, societies, and land in the present times. And his observations seem ever more pertinent today when we are witness to how collective memory, especially around political identity, national claims, and religion, and all sorts of identity factors in most parts of the world is up for grabs, regardless of what books tell us, regardless of what history tells us, regardless of what archives might have to tell us. So what's interesting is that what Said was so perceptively capturing in his paper about the widespread prominence of memory and geography, both as motifs and as methods, coincided rather well with the widespread attention of the same in spaces of contemporary art throughout the decade that followed. That's in the 2000s. If you think about it, there's so many art projects, there's so many institutions, so many museums that are interested in mapping, that are interested in archives, and the, the definition of mapping and archiving was also going on expanding. So two related sites, throughout, though not identical to memory and geography, found a resurgence alongside memory, uh, alongside these, memory and geography, that is of the archive and cartography. Both of these became late motifs for a number of artists, curators, institutions alike, and oftentimes worked as methods, such as, like I mentioned, by way of mapping projects, particularly in contexts where colonial histories and post-colonial discourse was given a lot of importance. The cartographic reference, of course, also melded into the art world's reflections on different locations and their relationship to the homogenizing forces of globalization. The examples here could be many. Take, say, the 50th Venice Biennale in 2003, where uh, the curator Bonami wanted viewers to explore the Biennale like a global map. Or if you take Okwi Onvizor's 
this is a book on, if you were interested in following Edward Said's um, essay on um, Palestine, Memory, Invention, and Space, it's featured in this book. You had, uh, you had the Archive Fever exhibition following from a uh, seminal essay by Jacques Derrida that Aukwe Onwizo curated in 2008. And of course, you had a number of regional survey exhibitions representing South Asia, China, um, so many other regions, Africa, and so many museums all around the world. So it was, of course, no mere coincidence that the widespread reference of maps and archives in the field of contemporary art was because it's hard to ignore how much memory, geography, the archive, and uh, cartography became battlegrounds across all fields in the time of the digital age. However, as much as Said's analytical insights into that historical moment might have seemed like a prognosis of what was coming, that, that there would be a deepening and more pervasiveness of the forms of control, power, surveillance through more sophisticated archives and maps, perhaps we might read them as completely the opposite. And what I'm basically trying to say is that we might say, see that archives are becoming bigger and that more and more archives, we might see that more and more mapping is getting done, Google's doing mapping and all of these kind of things, but maybe just for a moment, if we imagine that that's not just an improvement of older maps, but maybe something has shifted. Maybe it's, it's doing something else. It's not a linear history of those same maps and archives that we saw from colonial regimes. So maybe what, what, um, what Said was, was sort of pointing to, that now these things are about inventing stuff. It's not about just excavating the past. Uh, mark the end of an era from where the archive and cartography started going completely out of control, with the recognition and attention given to memory and geography as tools pliable for those in power, there were also tools for those who were not in power, and that we saw ourselves arriving at uh, a new discursive threshold where both memory and geography would never be the same again. And the question that has been lingering on in my mind is that in the era which is best defined as globalization, where we have often found and the pr primary preoccupation being cartographic references, such as the local versus the global, or national versus the transnational, national versus regional, the important cities have gained as a site, um, global north versus global uh, south, and all of these have been largely discussed in globalization. What happens to memory and archive in the age of globalization? Um, would it just be about inclusion and exclusion of, of what goes into archives and what has not gone into archives? Would it be about the relation of memory and forgetting? Continental philosophy and post-colonialism had already done that by very powerful critiques of expanding the notion of archives on behalf of communities that did not have archives, right? So there was this kind of an expansion of that happening on very political terms as well. But with the digital age, is something shifting? And with globalization, are both maps and archives doing something else? Our memory, is the notion of memory something else now? And if we think about it, we have gotten very accustomed and used to the fact that we talk about memory in terms of storage capacity of hard disks, hard drives, memory sticks, things like that, right? So there's already a sor sort of transference of the idea of memory towards other devices. And how does that relate to our mental memory, our collective memory, our individual memory? Here, I think contemporary art has a telling tale because the very idea of archives was being transformed, as we see. And we saw in art a shift on emphasis from, collect from collections to massive accumulations. Think of Subodh Gupta and a number of artists who do these massive accumulative forms, right? Lots of bartans just accumulating on and on. Have you guys seen any of those installations? Just really massive accumulations, yeah? Or from, from singular mark making and subjective utterance to constantly repetitive forms. And you have these repetitive forms either in the form of sketch marks or repetitive performances, or from containment and classification of things into a vast proliferation, just releasing things from their category or adding multiple categories to things. Or from protocols of retrieval to now a rhetoric of accessibility that should be granted for all. So whereas archives were all about what do we get access to, what are the protocols of access, suddenly everyone's talking about everything should be made accessible. And you have Julian Assange and you have Edward Snowden as whistleblowers, but also various artists and various collectives who feel and militantly believe that everything should be made accessible like without any, uh, any bias. The critiques, alternatives, and counter-archives produced in the last two decades, though, uh, through contemporary art and through new technologies of capture and storage that is accessible to wider and wider publics, swells up to seem like a new resurgence of both archives 
in a much, much more expanded and flexible sense. So if you think about it, nowadays we talk about archives as in such a loose and open-ended way, such as my grandmother's an archive of so many stories, or my trunk at home is, a, is an archive of memories, or for instance, a film is an archive of a city. So we're basically quite flexible with using the term archive for any sort of collection, and we're quite okay with that, right? To my mind, this makes me revisit the history of artistic practice from a very different lens, which is to delve into how artists from different parts of the world broadly worked out their own archive. And, you know, at Asia Archive, I often visit a lot of artists' archives, both in India, sometimes overseas, and it's a really fascinating place. I mean, technically speaking, I shouldn't be calling them archives. Technically speaking, I should just be calling them collections. You know, perhaps your own grandfathers and grandparents and grandmothers and I don't know, even parents might have maintained scrapbooks. Perhaps some of them would have maintained collection of magazines or newspaper clippings, right? There's all of that happening. But if you think about it, with, if you have had a chance to visit, say, artists or creative people's archives, there's a whole big mess of things. And I'll be showing you some of that. So, and I have my opinion on some of those, which I wanted to share. So to my mind, um, we have to visit the history of art practice from a very different lens, right? And just as newly emerging notions around second from Second World War, were building a redefined, you know, like when the nation states were building their own institutions, their own museums, their own archives, or also redefining the his history of their own nations. Just like that, my contention is that a lot of artists were at the same time developing parallel collections. They were as obsessively collecting stuff, right? And producing their own sorts of classifications. So in a sense, artists almost foresaw the coming of the information explosion that we are uh, in the midst of today. You go to any artist archive who were active in the 50s, 60s, 70s, the kinds of scrapbooks, ephemera, pictures, photographs, documents that they collected was baffling. And these collections charted out a very different, uh, charted out very different itineraries, followed very different classification systems, and some of which we start thinking about today on the internet, for instance, the way things accumulate, the way things fall into certain categories, it's, it's quite interesting. And, and artists were trying some of those things out too. And so, um, what, what if we momentarily shift our gaze away from, say, a history of artworks of those artists and in, instead go into very private practices that would not actually find its way into art history? I mean, usually history of art is written about the artist's life and the artwork that they were making, right? At the most, a little bit of biographical detail into some of the drawings that they made and things. But what if we, what if we started visiting these archives for a very different purpose? And for a moment, treat the archive not as a site of providing evidence and clues about the context in which artworks were made or places where artists were based, but rather as sites that have immense potential to tell a very different story about the future. And the question that emerges is that how can archives serve as a site of complete reimagination of the history of art? And these are some of the things that we've kind of been touching on in the, in the five-day program that I was, uh, the course that I was conducting over here, to revisit art history from a completely different vantage point, from very different archives and itineraries. Um, it is with these questions in mind that I revisited the life and practice of one Hong Kong artist by the name of Habe Chun, who was active in the 60s and 70s, who was a well-known sculptor and printmaker, and had a private practice where he archived like this. Um, and, well, he practically collected everything under the sun. And, you know, in Hong Kong, they're very tiny spaces. So despite having a very tiny home, it's all congested. It's a bit like Bombay, where it's all, always vertical. And in, these tiny, in a tiny studio space of his, he maintained an archive that looked somewhat like this. And if you... If you oh, I have a pointer. Um, if you... Go, if you start going into these boxes, you start seeing different categories he was making. For instance, he was making boxes of all paintings that had the color red. Right now, if you go on Google search, they've started coming up with image searches. You don't have to type a word. You can just drag an image into a search, search box, and it'll start finding similar images based on parameters like color, based on parameters like composition, based on very formal parameters, sometimes also linking with the website that those images come from, right? So in a sense, he was experiment dif experimenting very different classifications. What he was also doing, and this was really interesting, is Hong Kong was a port city. So there was a circulation of magazines, there was a circulation of books, there was a circulation of images happening in the city via his studio, via, you know, all sorts of channels. And he would, in the analog era, sort of like keep collecting the way we make 
collections on our hard drives, we collect books, we collect images on our phones, right? So he's basically collecting everything. And he wasn't just collecting them and keeping them, he was also processing them to make these collage sort of books, right? So he's making these scrapbooks of completely erratic or sometimes sensible connections that he would think. And this has inspired a number of projects that, that led um, artists to come visit Habik Chun's archive and create their own projects. So for instance, there's a very important artist group called the Atlas Group. Um, and this Atlas Group is basically a fictitious group of people which is actually only led by one person who, um, who whose name is Walid Rad and he comes from Lebanon. And he's been looking at a very political history of the archive and trying to re, re, represent it by showing those things which are missing in the archive. And what he did when he visited Habik Chun's archive is that you have something on a flat scrapbook, he made it into 3D and pop up. So all those spaces that you saw in scrapbooks, almost like portals into other rooms, other spaces, other worlds, he sort of made it into a pop up thing of different Art Nouveau and whatnot coming together in, in the form of a drawing room, in the form of a living room, in the form of a museum. And, he, and you can visit our website at AA to check out the kind of things that he was doing, revisiting another artist's archive. Yeah. So um, this, is, this is one of the unique cases that, that I just wanted to share and I've delved into this in a project I did at Shanghai Biennale. But before that, I'm going to go into quickly taking you through the Shanghai Biennale because I'm sure most of you might not have come across it. And this is going to be non-reading. So if in case you're getting bored by my reading, now is when I can speak more. So you guys know about, maybe I can take the mic. So um, you guys know about Biennales, right? We have the Kochi Biennale, we've had Pune Biennale, we've had um, the Dharavi Biennale. I think these, some of these still continue to happen, right? So um, the 11 Shanghai Biennale, as the number suggests, has already happened Hello. Okay. Uh, did you hear everything I said two minutes ago? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so the 11th Shanghai Biennale, as the, as the name suggests, is in its 11th edition in 2016-17. Uh, and therefore, it's been around for 22 years. And in its, in its place in China, because it's in Shanghai, it's tried to redefine or kind of figure out how to show the field, how to show the world, by inviting various curators. And in 2016, they invited uh, a collective of artists called the Rux Media Collective to be the chief curators of this. The Biennale takes place in this massive building called the Power Station of Art. It used to be a power station and is now converted into a contemporary art museum. It's also an interesting space in which this museum does not show their contemporary art collection on a regular basis. In fact, most of the times they're inviting people to come curate shows of works outside of the collection and sometimes draw from the collection which is stored somewhere else and shown in the galleries here. So the 11th Shanghai Biennale began on the 11th of November in 2016, ran up till March this year. Um, every Biennale usually comes up with its own curatorial methods, its own curatorial strategies. It also defines its own curatorial team, right? It's not just about defining a concept or a thematic. And so for the, for the Shanghai Biennale, uh, Rux came up with a sort of uh, a format where there would be a curatorial collegiate, a bunch of sort of curator, uh, curatorial team that would work closely with Rux Media Collective for research, for being in conversation with artists, for developing ideas along with them. There was also uh, exhibition architects who, in fact, it's wonderful that uh, we're meeting here again in this institution, um, Rupali and Prasad, who are the exhibition architects. Um, with them, we were defining the sort of architectural principles which would sort of define this experience of the Biennale exhibition. Um, and what was interesting was that we didn't want to, because it's a four month exhibition, you don't just define space, you have to define time with it. How are you gonna be an architect of not only space, but also of time? So the conversation we, we were having in the, in the studios for well over eight to 10 months was about how are we gonna build this? How are we gonna build an experience of time and space across those four months, yeah? Along with that, we had a graphic designer, we had a publications editor. So we had a whole bunch of people who would be ideating together and as any team or many teams go, there was really no hierarchy and there was a, a lot of exchange of ideas and dialogues, yeah? The inspiration from the Biennale came from, well, primarily two sources. One is a sci-fi novel 
that came out just a year ago before we started curating, which is called The Three-Body Problem. It's a, it's a sci-fi novel, and it felt very relevant today. The relevance of sci-fi today, because reality is becoming and seeming more alien and alien, and at the same time familiar. So it's, it's posing these, these strange kind of encounters with natural elements, with machines, with AI, all sorts of things are happening, right? And so we thought sci-fi is a good place to begin because it speculates futures based on present sort of models that you have with you, right? Um, this novel, I can actually go on because it's, it's, there's so many good stories, but this novel's, uh, this novel's about a place which had three suns and there was a contact established with life outside of the planet and um, outside of the planet, there were various countries or various places that were trying to establish this contact and there were various technologies being used and science was obviously coming into play, right? Um, one of the main things about this novel was that all the current parameters of reality that we imagine were kind of out for a toss. There was no stability in all the concepts you had for today. And that kind of inspired us to think about the present times. Are any of the, which of the older concepts are useful for us today and which of the older concepts might not be, we might be using those concepts, but actually there's something else going on. So we have to come up, invent new concepts for the reality that we're inhabiting, yeah? Another inspiration was uh, Rupi Ghatak's uh, Jukti Takur Gapo, which is a film about um, three figures. If you notice, there were three sons in this and it's a three-body problem. And uh, Rupi Ghatak's Jukti Takur Gapo, which translates from Bengali into argument, counter-argument and stories. And basically, we live in a time when there are massive arguments being made that the world is coming to an end. You know, the whole world, because of the climate change, is, is strung on just two degrees of global warming, or that we've, we've sucked out all the resources, there's no going back. So there's one, one sort of a big argument being made that there's no, um, there's no hope. There's another argument being made which is completely in denial, but also other arguments being made that it can change if we do this, if we do that. So there are arguments, counter-arguments, and of course there are stories in which they navigate these realities, these philosophies and concepts, right? The other thing about three-body problem is that it actually comes from a Newtonian concept, which, which says that, you know, if you have two bodies, you can sort of predict the force that they exert on each other. But if you have a third body, there's no telling what the alignment of forces will be. And we're sort of wondering about those alignment of forces today in terms of what are the main theses about the world, what are the main counter thesis, antithesis about the world, and what are the speculative zones that are opening up, and what is the relation of force that they exert on each other. It's like how, on the one hand, Zizek says that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism, right? So you have these sort of realities also existing, and you have people trying to rethink different systems, right? Um, we weren't only inspired by films and cinema, we were also inspired by the by the things around us. And one of those was this uh, fascinating, fascinating building that was made in 1933 in Shanghai. It was called the Slaughterhouse. And what you see is obviously one angle, but and it looks like a very strange angle, but the building was equally strange. And it had all of these slopes and all of these sort of curves going on. The reason being, you uh, when the cows and cattle was, were brought in for slaughtering, um, at no place should have should blood have been allowed to stay. So the building continuously makes those, the blood that is, that, is, <laughs> that is shed from the small train flow down into a common drainage system, right? So we were thinking about this as, a, as an architectural inspiration, not about blood, but about flows, right? So um, how, what kind of flows do we want to create? What kind of flows of meanings? What kind of flows of people? What kind of flows of works pointing to each other? what kind of semantics, language flows, all of these kind of things was an inspiration. So we were drawing from all of these things. And so let me start telling you how we were kind of conceiving the exhibition. We were thinking about it, it like folds. How can we create a folded experience where, you know, like if you take a origami thing, and in fact, if it's a bad origami, um, you can fold it out. And once you, fold, once you try folding it back, you don't quite know if it will fold back the same way as you had it before. In fact, if you do it with good, good origami, and if you're not a good at origami, the same thing's going to happen, right? You're not going to be able to fold it back. So how do you create an ex experience of an exhibition, of a space and time, which will continuously unfold for you, that once you enter it and enter it again from another place, you won't have the same experience, because you'll be seeing different sight lines, different flows happening. And so we were thinking about space and all of these things in that way. And um, 
these kind of things also, these kind of ideas, concepts also carried through uh, through the kind of artworks that we chose. So this, for instance, is a close-up of a work by Marilyn Dachman. Have you guys heard of the Foucault pendulum? Any of you? Yes, sort of? Okay. Um, it's not by Michel Foucault. Uh, if in case you're wondering, it's Leon Foucault, uh, this major uh, astrophysicist. Or I don't know if it, that term was around. Basically, he was into cos cosmos and all of these things, and he was studying those. And Leon Foucault came up with this thing called the Foucault's pendulum, which basically is, is this pendulum suspended at a height of 67 meters. And if you just leave it suspended from that height, and of course it had a specific weight, I think 28 kgs or something. So it was a heavy pendulum, it wasn't a tiny one. If you leave it suspended, the rotation of the Earth causes the planes of axis to shift very slowly. And if you're doing it from the North Pole, it takes 24 hours. If you're doing it closer to the equator, it takes 35 to longer hours. And so this pendulum actually doesn't stay still. It slowly, it slowly moves. And it's not actually the pendulum moving. It's the Earth's axis moving, right? And so there's an artist from the Netherlands who's now based in Brussels. Uh, her name's Marilyn Dijkman. And she works with these kind of forces that come and affect us from outer space. And she made this beautiful sort of Foucault pendulum in present times. I'll show you the picture afterwards, which is basically mapping the orbit of the Earth in real time using uh, digital signals that were being sent from a lab in Netherlands. So there was a, contra a new contraption, an updated version. Now, the fascinating thing about Foucault's pendulum is that, I think it's too dark. You get the picture, right? So. Um, the fascinating thing about, let me put it back so that I can see you guys. Uh, the fascinating thing about Foucault's pendulum is that in one room, it's capturing on the one hand the orbit of the Earth, right, around the sun, and the rotation on an axis. It's also obviously in a slower, and if, it, if it's left for a much longer time, also sort of calculating or drawing or dancing the orbit of the sun in its galaxy, right? If it's allowed, because it's not just the sun revolving around the, uh, sorry, Earth revolving around the sun, it's the sun revolving as well, rotating the galaxy. And if you think about it in a larger sense, there is a rotation of the galaxy around perhaps bigger galaxies. So the question that intrigues a lot of scientists and even philosophers is how can something captured in a room tell us something about the entire universe? It makes you think about space very differently, right? It makes you think about what art can do and what science can do, where it's not about trying to represent a simple model in a room, but in fact, the Earth, or no, rather the universe's dance is happening in your room, right? Through a pendulum like this. And that's the absolute, that's the most fascinating thing about Foucault's pendulum, which is what inspires Marilyn Dijkman, which is what inspired us. And so, if the universe is dancing and we can, we can sense that dance in a room, uh, Marilyn Dijkman brought in a cluster of artworks. She's one of those artists who works, who's been working with these kind of philosophies, science experiments for many, many years. And so we made a category of artists not based on mediums or not based on what political issues or thematic issues that they work with, but, what, but on certain sort of attitudes towards practice. So one, for instance, category we had going was the terminal. And this terminal basically meant that, you know, like historians and scientists or biologists, or nuclear physicists, they're working in one field on a specific area for years and years and years. They're not jumping from one thing to another, just like that. There are quite a few artists who've been working one, on one thing or on similar things for a long, long time. And Marilyn is one of those artists, and we had a few more. So we call these clusters, terminals, where artists bring together a cluster of works which show these vast, long durée experimentation that they've been doing over the years into one cluster of a space. So you can kind of capture a sense of an intensity of someone's exploration, and that's what art also does, right? So the cluster of things that she had included sort of how light falls on various things and a whole bunch of photographs that she was doing, how, what kinds of lights fall on objects and how they get illuminated, what kind of objects also throw out light, the Foucault pendulum, uh, an asteroid that is being studied by NASA at the moment, right? So she brought this cluster, and she also brought in uh, a lunar table, a sort of secret society in Birmingham, many centuries, ago, two, two, three centuries ago, used to meet uh, regularly to discuss uh, the moon and the forces of the moon upon our lives, right? And you know, if, if 
if moons can ca cause water and tidal waves to happen, obviously they must be impacting us because of the huge water content in our bodies, right? So um, the, kind of ex the kind of discussion that they were having back then was something she captured. As much as we were looking at these cosmic forces on the Earth, we were also looking at newer ways to think about the Earth, about land um, in present times. And for instance, you have an artist like uh, Vinu from Kerala, uh, who uh, is often working with, uh, with questions of class struggle, comes from a Dalit background, and is often working on motifs that have had a strong presence in Dalit movements. And he draws this work called Noon Rest from one of the motifs from the Ayankali movement in the 70s, where uh, a lot of uh, Dalit farmers, or what I, I shouldn't call them farmers because their work was to basically cut weed using sickles, um, uh, protested at one point. But before the protest, their usual habit was every afternoon when they're taking rest, they hook these sickles onto trees and then go to sleep. So that's their afternoon siesta, yeah? So it's a bit like, how, how can we imagine different notions or different images of rest? We usually think about pillows and cushions, but there's also an image which looks so violent, but in fact was also an image of rest of, of sickles hooked onto trees, right? Um, what was what was also fascinating is that in a decade later, when the when the when the same the same community protested against people who were exploiting them, they said that we refuse to work, and the symbol of refusal was also hooks or sickles hooked onto trees. So he brought this one work into this, and it was fascinating when we realized that we were quite particular about the fact that where shadows are maintained, where shadows are not maintained. And in this work, we were we were. We were very conscious and aware that a shadow has to fall. Why? Because the question of shadow falling on land or sh falling on anyone is is a question of power and violence in, say, the caste struggle. Right? You don't want one shadow falling onto another. So we were having works like these, and this is in fact a picture captured on Instagram. So it was fascinating. You know, when people say, "But do people understand this or not?" Well, maybe some people in, in among the visitors may not have understood all the context, and they might look it up. But they were getting these affective, these visual cues, and someone would even capture the effect of the shadow in this work uh, on Instagram, right? That's how the work looked like. Behind what you see is a is a is a, is a print uh, by Navjot Altaf, an artist based in Bombay, who has been working a lot in Bastar and mining industries, and who's been basically talking about uh, the earth being dug up continuously for various iron ores and things. And if you think about it. If the image of modernity, if the image of um, progress has been about high-rise buildings, the flip side of that is deep, deep crevices in the earth, right? And that has been happening continuously in 20th century, except that's not what we see most of the time. So she's basically looking at these deep crevices in the earth. And in front of that, we have Vinu, Vinu's uh, noon rest. And alongside that, we have an artist from Switzerland who is into um, coding. He's a programmer and coder. And he went into various fossil sites and found one which was about 150 million years ago. And he sort of digitally rendered the textures into a code which would then transfer into a sound file. And on these tapes, on these sorry, LPs, there's a, a translation of the fossil that is 150 million years ago singing aloud or sort of playing aloud in this, in this whole area. So how do we imagine the notion of time in the space of an exhibition, in the, in the space of a curatorial experience, right? So basically, uh, the 20th century and the long history of digging, which has been simultaneous with a lot of history of high rises or building, a uh, history of protests and struggles on land or for land, and the, the, the deep time and deep sounds of the earth all brought into one space as an experience, yeah? Um, Robin Mayer's work draws a lot of research as well, and he was looking at, have you guys heard of the Golden Voyager record sent out and in, sent into outer space in 1977? So this was basically, do you guys know Carl Sagan? Yeah, Carl Sagan was this astrophysicist, author, amazing guy, uh, who was working with NASA, and when NASA was sending out, of course NASA has its own politics, let's not forget that, but when he was working with NASA in 77, he was also figuring out, look, if there is life outside of the Earth, Let's send some sort of artifacts, let's send some signals to them so that they get to know us and maybe they'll feel invited that we're sending them something to be excited about, right? So they captured sound of whales, of birds, of, of human beings, of different languages. They recorded all sorts of things on these, on these discs that they sent into outer space. 
and those disks are still probably floating around even today. And they're floating around, and maybe we might find them in the future. Maybe Robin Mayer's own LPs of 150 million years ago were also, those fossils might have been signals into the present. That there, there also may be life that those many millions of years ago that left something for us to decode, just like we're trying to leave something else to decode for the future or for another life out there, right? This is what the work looks like. Those are the fossils that he was sort of drawing from. Those are the LPs, that's the LP player playing. Yeah. We also, since we're talking about Earth and, and things that are you know, being excavated and stuff, um, usually the narrative is that we're kind of sucking out everything from the Earth, right? So here's an artist from Senegal, from, uh, 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 from uh, the African continent, where um, he does a lot of photography. And his thesis is that we're not actually sucking out anything. Or we might think we're sucking out and hollowing out the Earth, but the Earth is actually rising. And what are the elements that they rise in? What form will they rise? They will be unrecognizable. They might have human sort of features, but whatever they are, the Earth is rising, the waters are rising, the heat is rising, the cold is rising, things are rising, nothing is, go nothing is being sucked out to be hollowed out, right? Um, we also had other species going on in the space of the exhibition. So we have an artist from Argentina, uh, Thomas Saracino, who does, who's got a massive studio uh, in which there are about 50 people who are scientists, who are people doing their PhDs, uh, who are artists, who are uh, technicians, electronic coders, all of these people working together to figure out um, but all sorts of things, which include, if you look up his website, you'll find that currently he's working on how to make cities lift off using heat control or temperature control. You can check these out on his project, on his website. But we invited a work where he, he brought spiders, making a web live in the exhibition space. And he, he does a lot of research on spiders from different places, different species, and he, and he, and he did a lot of research on a specific kind of spider uh, species within China, which he then had going on in the space of the exhibition. Uh, we also had not just the past, but also the futures. This is an artifact in Chicago of African Oregon, uh, African American origin, uh, Jefferson Pinder, who it basically works a lot with the idea of Afrofuturism. Have you guys heard of Afrofuturism? It's basically uh, this movement that was that had a lot of very interesting people, everyone from jazz musicians to philosophers and thinkers and historians, talking about uh, uh, the possible futures imagined from Africa as a vantage point. And it has had all sorts of manifestations, such as someone we discussed in class called Sun Ra, a jazz uh, rock band. And, and uh, Sun Ra claimed that he came from the future. He always dressed up as, uh, in future attire, and he would be roaming around doing his concerts all the time. It wasn't just for the stage. That was the life he was living, telling I am from the future, and the future is going to be black. Okay? And so Jefferson Pinder creates this portal um, he's called it the black portal, which might be a portal into the future. And it's, it's, I mean, obviously the pictures don't do any justice, because if you go close to this, it's really magical in how it shimmers. It actually looks like you might just be able to go through it. Okay? Um, what's opposite to this is also very interesting. It's, a, it's a, uh, an artist collected from Guwahati, based in Guwahati, the Design Machine Collective. And they have this wall going, which is a cement sort of wall, uh, about seven feet high. And from inside, you can hear very low murmurs of protests, sounds of protest from various parts of the world, but largely India. And so you go close to this and you see a wall blocking the exhibition. Um, uh, oh, sorry, blocking the portal, and you see these murmurs of revolution happening, and then when you cross the wall, you see the portal to the future, which is going to be black. Um, so these are the kind of spaces we created. If Big Brother is watching you, are we not watching that? There's a work by Chen Zhe an artist, a young artist based in uh, Shanghai, who works a lot with the body and close-ups of the body, sometimes harming her body as a way to claim herself. If you guys are going to think you're going to take care of me, I will decide how I want to take care of myself or harm myself. And so she made this massive print of an eye looking out. If Big Brother's watching us, we're also watching back, right? Uh, or how do, how do spaces get claimed? An artist from Pakistan, Aisha Jatoy, who in... Uh, uh, China Chow in Karachi, I think Karachi or Islamabad. There's a China Chow where there's a fighter jet that was used in the Indochina War, uh, and uh, or one of those, I can't remember exactly which one, I think it was. But basically, a jet that was used in that, in which she, and then obviously, it's a public 
monument, it's hyper masculine, it's about war, it's about men, all of these things. And so she quickly goes and does a performance where she uh, where she takes her clothes, washes them in a tasla, and basically just spread them on the jet and leaves. And so she recorded this performance because it wasn't done as an announcement. She just quickly did it and left. And so there's a video a friend of hers made and photographed that were taken. We were showing these photographs in the in the Biennale as, as another way of claiming history in a sense. We had another artist who did terminals. If you remember, I was talking about artists who were doing long UA explorations. This is an artist from Guatemala who works a lot with performance art. And as she works with performance art, um, she's been looking at the body as an individual body, but also as a collective body. What is the social body? What is the body of memory? Uh, what kind of a social body do we want to create? And what kind of bodies have been harmed and violated upon? And so for the past many decades, she's been looking at the kind of uh, non-stop violence happening on the community by the state, state-authorized violence. And we, we, are, we invited seven works of hers to come and be brought in as video documentation of photographs of those. So it was also an interesting conversation with her where she, we had a conversation saying, you know, we want to bring seven works of yours that you've done in the past. How do we show them together? Because as a performance artist, are you going to do them as a sequence? So, or are you going to call someone else to do them for you? And so the conversation went on and on into becoming that, no, I'm going to send you videos. So let's, let's show all those videos and the body that is, that is so visibly present, but also not present. And basically the body today is refracted into multiple layers of the digital, of the virtual, of the simulated and of the physical, right? So uh, we decided to have seven works of ours shown as video format. Um, this one is called uh, La Verdad, which means uh, the truth, in which he was uh, reading testimonies of a lot of survivors or victims' families' um, te uh, testimonies, right? So she's reading these testimonies out, and a dentist was called by her. We're, we're literally in the same position as how the performance works. She's on a table, the audience is here, She's reading out these testimonies. They sound grueling and really disturbing. And, uh, and a dentist comes and administers anesthesia into her gums while she's reading this out. Right? And as the dentist does this, her, her jaw, her tongue slowly starts going numb. And as it goes numb, her jaw falls. And the only sound you hear is a wailing sound. And it's not like a screeching loud scream. It's just a wailing sound because words are not any more possible. And She's still persisting in reading those testimonies. And so it becomes a, a really hair-raising sort of an experience because you basically the work is almost like saying that we're still hearing those screams. And those screams are not sort of irrational screams. These are those testimonies that we hear around us all the time, right? Uh, she's reading those testimonies. So some really powerful stuff um, that she's been doing. And so I bring someone who is actually not an artist we showed at the Shanghai Biennale, but was a nice provocation for me at least, in that as much as we're thinking of ourselves as, you know, major advancement from old, old primates or whatever, or from the 20th century, we as human beings, as human species, are further evolving perhaps. Uh, there's an artist from Italy who in the 60s announced that we're not the most advanced of our own species. We're probably primitives of a new era, primitives of a new species. We don't quite know what that species is going to be. This is sort of like the kind of questions we were internally asking ourselves um, for the Shanghai Biennale. What, what will the shape of the future take? What will we be in it? Will we be one singular we as human species or multi-species? Uh, what will the role of the machines be in us as a we? So how do you tame those forces? You know, it's very interesting. I was reading an article some, some uh, weeks ago, which I think was in the Atlantic, which said something on the lines that anyone born after the 60s has a small percentage of radioactivity in their teeth. All the nuclear tests that were happening across the Atlantic and Pacific have now been absorbed so deep into the lands and seas that much of the food that we eat and we grow up on has left further generations having radioactivity. So in a sense, we're all partially radioactive. And how does that sound, right? So, so here's an artist from Germany uh, uh, who basically has been going into uranium mines or work, meeting miners who have been working in uranium mines to collect their tools because the tools are also radioactive. And she creates these artificial environments of a, an old model of cameras that instead of cap capturing the image are uh, throwing off images of those tools which perhaps are radioactive just as much as we are. 
a group from China that actually works very closely with the with the labor community uh, or different labor labor communities that actually brought together a lot of tools that people use, and in in putting those tools together, they, they form this this thin sheet of a metallic wall with all those tools for it. It's, it's a phenomenal thing. It's a huge wall. It was quite a an architectural task to finally have this wall erected with as little support as possible. And so Bani Prasad and all of these people and a couple of people in China, we all had to really put our brains into how to make this even stand. And then when you see it, on one side you see these tools, on the other you see these massive um, uh, numbers of uh, uh, spikes. Um, how do you face other gravities, right? And so we had performance artists who come, came to certain parts certain times of the day who were basically uh, dancing with rains, highly orchestrated, extremely beautiful and serene. So it was a not all disturbing and radioactive. There were also these you know, movements of rains happening in very real time. And uh, it also almost makes you, if you think about you know, the meteorological news that you see, those, you know, by the end, you still watch news, that is. Um, I don't think it's any more even news to see those weather channels and weather forecasts. Maybe not in, at least not on our stuff and stuff. Anyway, so, uh, on the weather forecast, you see the way the world is shown, they show these winds, right? And we, one might also trace the, the movement of grains and the movement of food and all of these things along with the waters and winds that are happening. And this, this performance sort of gathers everyone around to, to see this dance happening. You have figures, performance artists also um, doing some uh, really visceral things. And you, might, you can see a, a, so, a sort of reinterpretation of this in the, one of the studios that the fifth semester students have uh, put up an exhibition in where uh, they sort of done a sort of feedback loop onto this video. But basically he grew up in Congo, he's from France, now based in the outskirts of Paris, and he does these performances where he comes in a suit, a white, thin, young, uh, not young, but sort of middle-aged and very good looking, comes and sits, goes into a slow frenzy, he's murmuring something no one understands, and then starts putting clay on his face, and as he starts putting clay, he becomes faceless because he completely covers his face into a flat surface, right? You guys can check him out, his name is Olivier Sagazan, and uh, um, as he covers his face, new faces start emerging, and so he will poke, if you saw the video downstairs, you would see he took his fingers, poked himself in the eyes with black paint, so there's paint dripping, then he takes another two fingers uh, with black paint again and just puts this small stroke on his face and it looks like a Hitler face. It starts looking like a bird. So many faces emerge and recede in this performance. And I was asking him how exactly, what is he thinking before he starts? By the way, he's been doing these performances for the past 15 years. This is his work, this is his practice. He doesn't make new work. This is the one work that he keeps doing again and again, any place he's invited. That, he's decided, is, is what his lifelong sort of project, at least so far, has been, right? So I was asking, what, did, what exactly are you thinking when you, when you start, when you're just about to get into this? And he was saying, you know, um, well, number one, I just go out for a walk and I'm just by myself. Basically, I'm trying to understand, what is my face? What am I facing? What is the world that I'm facing? And what are the faces that are encountering me? And so what exactly is containable, what is uncontainable, what is familiar, what is unfamiliar. And from that, he tries to dig out these different images. And each, performances ha each performance has a variation that those faces do change in quality. And at the end of it, he gets some twigs, which he sets up on his head, and he sets it on fire. So some of the performances also end up having fire on his head. Because this was in a museum, um, that was not allowed. But he also changed, tweaked his performance a little bit in this, where he got clay not just on his face, but also on his body, and became one new expanded body, and then pushed it out and became two bodies, and then started going to three body problems and all of that. So he was responding very interestingly to the three body problem. <coughs> when we were thinking about the architecture and experience of this, of this Biennale, we weren't just thinking about how we're going to make the walls, how we're going to block views, but also what kind of other notions of architecture can we work with. Like I mentioned, we were thinking architecture both time-wise and space-wise, and when we say time-wise, it can of course mean how we sculpt time, but also at the same time, how do provisional architectures form? And we were working with the idea of orbits in the exhibition. What kind of orbits or contours of the public are we anticipating? And it was a very interesting experience because some of those started realizing and some were unanticipated. So, such as, for instance, this. Every day, whenever this performance took place, a sort of wall got constructed around 
And so this is also the exhibition's architecture, if you come to think of it. And during the performance, there's this prominent circle, and then this dissipates. Or at another time, you have another line forming here. You have another interesting thing happening that because everyone could not crowd around and see this, it kept going up and down the escalator, non-stop. So there was this strange sort of chain of ants going non-stop up and down, just so that they can see a view of this because it was too crowded other ones, right? We also had someone from Benin, from also from the African continent, who basically for the longest time goes to whichever city he does, and he goes to scrap markets. He go, basically looks at the detritus, and not just scrap markets to see nice, antique, beautiful, nostalgic stuff, but basically what is the detritus of each culture, and um, puts those together and makes these massive sort of um, uh, displays of, of these things. And what's very interesting is that in a sense, what he's talking about is a, is a politics that is, um, that is against the art class. That is also saying that as much as you will try to classify our life, our objects, our things, the things that are discarded and from that, I would create new civilizations, new sort of entities, new cluster. And you see this massive experience of how when in China, he was finding things from Tibet, he was finding things from Hong Kong, Taiwan, what kind of forces of power are operating in the city? And he's picking those kind of things. It's, it's quite magical. He's, what, maybe 80, in his late 80s. And it feels like anything he touches really turns into gold. Because suddenly it all starts seeming magical. Everything that he's picked up or touched, right? So, so the experience is fascinating. This is a guy called Karl Max. Not Karl Marx, Karl Max. He has a Facebook profile. We found him on Facebook. So every day he makes a collage in hard copy, he takes a picture and he posts it on Facebook every day, like for years and years. So he's got thousands of these tiny collages and sometimes bigger ones that he's been living with and he's just been collecting. And his main circulation is through Facebook. Facebook is his gallery, right? And he usually doesn't show these. In fact, he's made one of the longest murals in the world using paint. So he's also into public art and things like that. But this is a practice that, like I was mentioning earlier, if you start looking at artists' archives, they start revealing a very different practice, right? So a very different sense of the present. Um, how are they processing the present just as much as how is the internet processing the present? Uh, things like that, yeah? So he is not just processing the present by absorbing a consumer of information. He's also reprocessing it, rejigging it. And so we invited him to do this massive wall which uh, was also designed by Prasad Upadhi as this very interesting curve in a passage of an exhibition. So you're walking in a passage, but suddenly from far away, you see this curve happening. And that curve is basically this wall, which has thousands of these collages that he put together um, over well, literally three days. He worked nonstop, day and night, in putting these together. And, and it was a very interesting set of conversations around this. So right outside, you had this uh, in one of the rooms. And then you go into the passage, and you find this. So you basically see all sorts of clashes of information, of objects, of things uh, running into each other. Yeah. So the question then is, uh, what does the revolt of sediments look like? And what, are, what kind of sediments are we talking about? We're talking about sedimentations of history. We're talking sedimentations of futures. What kind of, you guys have heard of retrofuturism? Basically, what kind of futures were imagined in the past, yeah? What kind of futures of the, of the past have sedimented into our lives? What have actually emerged to become realities? What have completely been submerged? Are things erupting? My contention is they sort of are. I was talking about memory and archives, and I was talking about cartography and maps. We're in an age where there are new elements being brought in. Uh, artificial intelligence, machinic intelligence. There are things being guided or maps that you know, our Uber, Uber drivers or our Ola cab drivers may not know the city, but their maps will tell them where to go. Things like that, right? They will, they will not know who the next ride is. So there are all sorts of ways that machinic intelligence is guiding us, is shaping our life. And on the other hand, there are all sorts of ways in which geology is erupting. And we have all of these panic situations of the earth coming to an end, or that there will be a new future, or that we have to colonize Mars, right? So we have all sorts of narratives going on. And so something obviously is erupting. And so I'm gonna end with uh, a project that I uh, was bringing in as an infracuratorial project. Just like we had terminals and we had 92 other artists. We also had, well, 92 included the terminal artists. We also had these infracuratorial projects where people from different practices were invited to, to test how curatorial thinking curatorial process would apply 
to their practices. Because I've been working for the past eight years in visual archives and also digital archives, it was a challenge for me to to bring in a different kind of curatorial logic, which is not just about showing these documents. He, look at this, it looks so nice in the past. Look at this, this was such a beautiful past and now look at the world is destroyed or something. Or not about, look, these are historical records that you missed seeing. It wasn't to make the invisible visible or those kind of things. It was using the archive on a very different idea of sedimentation, and on a very different idea which both combined uh, machining intelligence as well as um, sort of uh, geological framing of things, yeah? So I began with this project called Striated Light. Basically, if you think about 20th, or actually since Enlightenment, as much as it's all been about light and screens and, you know, perspectival view and all of these things, and in today's time, the screens, 20th century, or and even before, have for a long time also do been dominated by the dark room, right? Think of the camera obscura. Think of cinema. Think of minds. Yeah? There's so many sort of, think of black boxes today, think of these auditoriums, right? which are rendered dark in order to, for us to see the, the light, right? So there are also an equal number of dark spaces which, which can be mapped. And so I was looking at some of these ideas and what kind of lights of the past, of the present, and of the future striate, spread out through us, and then what kind of an archive would present itself. And in that presentation uh, came this project using Habik Chung's thousands and thousands of photographs that he develop into these contact sheets. You guys, some of you are really young. Have you ever seen contact sheets? Basically, you know when you have digital cameras and then when you put them on your palm, then you see these thumbnails? This was the, the analog version of thumbnails. Before you can go out and print everything out there, you sort of print them out on a smaller contact sheet and each one would be about A4 size or a little bigger. And on that you see which one you want to actually blow up into a proper photographic size, right? So. How did you collect it or did a lot of photography and not all of it was processed into final images. All of it was, most of it was left in contact sheets. How did those contact sheets figure into our present imagination? Do we only say that these were unrealized photographs? What if I look at them as realized works, realized objects? What kind of layers do they form? Because that's the only way I might as well look at them. And so came this project called Striated Light using his contact sheets and with the help of Rupali Prasad, with the help of a couple of other friends, we all came up with this sort of a structure which was 40 feet long. Um, how high was it? I can't remember the height. It was probably 10 feet, right? 10 or 12 feet high? I think 12, 10, 12 feet high. I think 12. 16 feet high? It could, sorry, no, not, not 16. The whole thing was... No, I, I shouldn't go in numbers. I'm bad with numbers. Uh, so uh, it, was, it was pretty high and it was 40 feet long. It covered a massive area of the exhibition space. And remember those tools I was talking about? That's the wall of tools facing this. What kind of tools of capture? What kind of tools are, are what kind of world of tools are we living in? There's, a, there's a, an installation here of a whale that was found on the shore projected onto a cardboard sort of setting. They were worked on the opposite side of also photographic nature. So we were looking at this interesting sort of escape of the archival sediments, the tools that sort of dig into the past or that dig into materials and other sorts of things. And digging and all of these things were obviously metaphors when we, when we talk about archives. And so this is what the exhibition space of one of the rooms looked like, which had all of these sediments, earth, photographs, excavations going on. This was also the room that had George Adiakpo, the guy who touches things and they turn to magic, that I was talking about. This also had that. So th these were the kind of spatial experiences that we were trying to bring together in the Shanghai Green Alley. Um, underneath this, this was also not permanently part of the building. This was designed by the exhibition architects uh, to become the sort of ambience for what we in the Biennale were calling theory opera. You know, as much as we think about theory belonging to books and then we differentiate it from practice which belongs to real life situations where we're using our hands, uh, if, you, if you think about it, theory also performs itself. The sorts of things that we encounter, the biases, the prejudices, the sort of love, the, the hatred, violence, genocides, all of these things are not guided just because of irrationality. They're guided by theories, that, right? Whether people have read those theories or have encountered those theories in other ways. And so we thought, what does theory, how does theory manifest? And we came, we came up with in a conversation, a beautiful phrase emerged. 
And when theory works, it sings, right? And it might be a song of a siren, which is warning sign, or it might be the song of the of the mermaids or something, which which might invite you, but you never know you're going to meet them or not, right? And so we had lots of theory opera uh, performances where we invited theorists, playwrights, artists, filmmakers to come and sort of translate theoretical concepts into some performative means. So it was a very interesting exercise for us to figure out, and not just like illustrate or demonstrate a theory uh, through a play, but also actually analytically structured in your thing. So for instance, one, one of the theory operas was a dialogue between Einstein and Bergson, which did historically happen, but we have very little record of it. So an artist, uh, well, actually a philosopher, had written a text imagining this conversation, which was then enacted between, you know Einstein? You have to know Einstein, right? You all know Einstein, right? Okay, so uh, Albert Einstein and Henri Bergson, a major philosopher from France, who was, who was talking about the concepts of time and long during, uh, and experiential, experiential time. So those kind of performances happen here. And so this became the environment, along with many other environments, where theory operas happen with um, striated light at the back, with these tools on one side, with tableaus, historical tableaus on another. And yeah, that's what was going on. So what does the revolt of sediments look like? We were exploring this and many other questions. And some of those questions I was projecting earlier. What kind of forces get tamed? Um, what are the futures going to be like? Um, and and if, you wanna, if you wanna take a look at more of those questions, um, you can go online and find quite a bit of information on the Shanghai Biennale website. You could also annoy the body of Prasad by asking them for a catalog copy and if it's in the library, then maybe they can lend it and you guys can see it in the school. Um, this, how does it connect to my work at the archive? Because at, at Asia Archive, we are also building artists' archives and we could take the usual route of just, you know, being, being the conventional archive that documents all the right stuff and puts it online, which is what we do. But then we don't want to leave it just at that. That's, that's pretty easy. Well, actually, maybe it's not that easy, but we know that can happen, right? So instead of just filling historical gaps by creating artist archives, we've also been thinking about how different imaginations of the archive exist amidst us through artist collections, and then how can they start becoming part of our thinking, becoming part of our uh, creative processes and with, across any field. So we invite musicians, we invite architects, we invite other artists, <laughs> filmmakers to deal with this. And this was an opportunity with Stride of Life for me to test other limits that our guys pose. The Shanghai Biennale, of course, was a, a much bigger monster, um, which you can build online. And with that, thank you very much. I will... Okay, um, if anyone has already a question. I had two questions. Uh, uh -huh. One was that um, I think we speak about art as something where uh, the form or uh, uh, the experience that you have becomes something very un unexpected. So do you feel that art at some point is predictable? And the uh, second was uh, when do you start saying that something is called an art? Wow. Second question is a very good question. Is art unpredictable? Well, see here's the thing. We're s we hear so much music, we read so much stuff. Hello? Ah, okay. So, second question is a really big question. When do we call something art? Uh, about whether art always poses something unpredictable? Well, some artworks do. And so, when I'm going out there to see art, I'm often looking for those things that, I, that are unpredictable to me. So, I engage with it, I, I spend time trying to find what exactly is going on. And to be honest, the kind of art I like most is the stuff I don't get. Because it makes me want to understand. And not, not get because the artist was thoughtless. I know that there's something attempted in the artwork, and I want to also crack it on my terms. So I usually enjoy most of the works that I don't immediately get. And then they stay with me, and I think about them. And then they come up with unexpected answers for me, or unexpected things I have thought about. Um, how, does, how, do, how does one decide what is art or not? That's a, 
That's a difficult question. There are many things that are, that are shown as art in various spaces, right? In museums and, and well, right now in the classroom. So who decided that that would be art? Was it me? Was it you? Was it the institution? These are sort of collective decisions, part institutionalized, part, part claimed. So I think they're to claim. And for all of those who think, you know, um, if I make something, is it going to be called art or not? Um, I think if you want to be positioned in the art field, which has its various institutions, then you've got to be, I guess you've got to be intelligent how you want to, how you want to position that thing, that object, that work, that practice, in relation to various of those uh, various elements of the field. But at the same time, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be limited to only what I see in galleries. If I feel like some people are experimenting something, just like scientists are, in creative, unpredictable ways, I would want to say that there's some kind of artistic exploration happening, and might even go out to say it is art. I hope that kind of answers. Um, and do you feel an architect's work is also called a piece of art? No, so, uh, do you as an architect feel some of your works are art? I mean, if you see it in a very broad sense, then sure, everything is art. You know, even like yesterday, those 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 friends of ours were talking about finance, the entire financial system being an art. So if, if you're talking about the, the ingenious ways and the creative ways in which something is being handled, sure, that's a very broad definition of art. But for me, at least, it would be about um, where some ideas are being really tested, both on linguistic levels, on effective levels, visual levels, things that, you know, things that are not always codified for us. And I would see basically those sort of practices, those sort of experiments as having the potential to be positioned as art in spaces. So we have to be finding those and attempting to those. And we obviously find a lot of stuff that is being called art, but we don't feel like it, it really moves us. And that's fine. I mean, maybe some other people are calling it out. At least, I mean, I can answer for myself. So is architecture art? It is an artistic practice. In certain ways, it is deployed. But it's not, I wouldn't say all architecture, all, you know, like the what housing do you call that? Those housing society which have this common template. Right? Housing society that have the same template, no? Um, the DDA apartments and stuff. I don't know whether you have the same. Yeah, but are they art? I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't know. There's a template that's just being reproduced, right? If the same thing is being reproduced again and again, why would I call it art? Um, there's a template that's being done for functional purposes. Uh, I'll give you another example. Um, art brings something that makes you think about that thing, right? So imagine if this is a model, which it is, but I, call, I decide to call it art. Suddenly all of us will be thinking about the bottleness of this bottle now. Because no one's going to come and pick it up and drink it. We're going to be thinking about why is this a model? Why is this there? What is the artist trying to say? What led the artist to... We're going to be thinking about a lot of abouts around this, right? And so it makes a, it's a philosophical proposition. Someone's gesture, someone's act, is inviting you to think about it, to speculate on it, right? And so it moves away from being just the usual everyday object into being a heightened sort of an experience where you're actually led to or compelled to think about it. And then of course someone can come in and, and have the work and it'll break out of that frame. But at the end of the day, in my calling this art, I'm inviting you to think about the bottleness of this or the placement of this or various conditions about this in this space, right? So in your architecture building, are you inviting a thought process, thinking about what you've done? Or only a functional thing? And obviously it's a tricky line because maybe it's doing both. Sorry, your last one. Okay. Uh, just out of curiosity, I want to ask you that uh, do you feel like you have worked as an architect sometime, being an artist? No, um, I don't think so. Um, have I ever felt like I've worked as an architect? No. Uh, I've worked closely with architects and the way they think, the way they do things is very inspiring. Um, I think my ideas would have somewhat informed them as much as their ideas would have informed me. I would learn something in process, how the processes are imagined. But no, I would not that thing. And here's the other thing, you see, a lot of times we conflate these two things. If it is art, then I'm an artist. Right? Uh, if I'm making a building, then I'm an architect. It's not always that way, right? I, as an architect, might, or might sometimes make an artwork. 
And that's a completely open proposition which everyone has to take. So you, a whole bunch of you guys, 40 of you downstairs, if I ask you have you become artists, you might say no. Or some of you might say yes, let's see, five years from now. But um, have you made an artwork? Sure. You, you, you created something as an exploratory exercise for yourself in which you're inviting others to also uh, explore with you some ideas, some experiences, right? And to think from there, not think only about it, but think from there about various things, right? So you could be making art without being an artist because think about writing, yeah? Not, we all write, but we don't call ourselves writers. We're quite okay with that. And we might be writing poetry, but we're not always calling ourselves poets. But that's not stopping us from very seriously, very genuinely, very emotionally, very tragically writing that poem. Right? We, we will still go about writing that poem and we will share it with our friends. And similarly, this is, I don't know, it's unfortunate that the field has created such an exclusivity that it feels like only artists can create art. Otherwise, I think any of you, because you're testing forms, you're just testing all sorts of ideas, you could be creating art even if you're not an architect, every now and then. Right? Yesterday, uh, our friends from Economic Space Agency, some of them identify themselves as philosophers and economists, but on one parallel track of their lives, they also do art projects because that's the space where these, they see as speculative possibilities that they want to intervene in the world with. Uh, Prasad put it so beautifully yesterday at the end of the conversation that what are you offering to the world? Right? And um, as, as architects as well, so well, people, whatever, we might sometimes be offering uh, a way to think about something based on a, an artwork we do. When you talk about the archive uh, that the artists have for themselves, the, that each artist sort of makes for himself or herself, so all the artists that you've come across who have had archives and you've got a chance to visit them, my question is, uh, so you were trying to then understand this, the history of art differently as against how it's usually seen, uh, maybe in a chronological order, but what happens when the artist is no longer there to talk about his archive? So what happens to his archive then? When it, if it goes, uh, if it splits and goes to various parts of the world and uh, it, then questioning what happens at how do you actually see the archival space then? Do you see the archival space itself splitting with uh, the objects of the archive? Oh. Nice question. Um, to frivolously answer your question about whether the, the author is not around, but a lot more interesting things happen because then you don't have to be tied to the meaning that the intention had been. A lot of artists are in fact because they're human beings, their own narrative about the same work changes, right? So in a sense, the memory of the work, and they started archiving those, you will see in the archive multiple meanings, narrative, interpretations about the same work. And so what goes and what goes, I mean it goes without saying then that actually there is no fixed meaning to things, especially not art. It always keeps splitting into multiple sort of narratives, into multiple directions. And then it is upon us to what kind of direction we want to give it. It's not about finding the true direction and presenting it to the world. Because sometimes those true directions are not even with the artists themselves, right? They themselves have changed their mind. I mean, there was a recent case a couple of years ago where Richard Serra, this uh, major installation artist and sculptor who makes these massive walls of portent steel, used to be making drawings and a museum collected them. And um, that drawing, I mean. And so after, say, 20 years or something, they wanted to do an exhibition, but what, they wanted to show that drawing, but they needed some restoration on it because it had sort of warped or uh, gotten moist. So they went to him to say that, you know, we're going to use this process, are you okay with it? And he says, you know, I just realized this work is not complete. I need to rework it. The museum flipped. They said, no, we bought this work, this is it. We can't change it anymore because then what we bought is, is changed. So he's like, no, I can't. I, I need to change it. I am the artist. I'm telling you this work is incomplete. I thought it was complete. I, I realize now that it's not complete. So you see, something like this is equally possible in an artwork. People, people may change their mind, their narratives may change. So with the archive, it's a space of a lot of potential. And for me, and for even my colleagues at AA, uh, I think we're all interested in, of course, finding the narratives that the artist wants to tell, 
that the time had to tell collectively by various people who were around or who remember, but also about what are the other sort of uh, directions that it opens up. I'll give you one small example from AA where um, it's very interesting that a lot of artists that we were working closely with uh, had certain narratives that they would prioritize, what they were doing back in India and things like that. Yeah? We started getting interested in a couple of other narratives as to where all were you traveling? Who were the, what were the friendships you were making in various parts of the world? Which countries did you visit? What was your relationship with the Soviet? What was your relationship with Europe and America? And you started realizing they were traveling so much. And after World War II, you had obviously Rockefeller and Charles Wallace and various kinds of institutions funding scholarships. So they would go into those areas, but they've also gone to Yugoslavia, they've also gone to Poland. And so these kind of stories start coming out. And then you start realizing, but with the archive, they, all, they also start changing the narrative. But they start saying, oh yeah, you know, we used to go there a lot. And then those narratives become the more dominant narrative, even in how they speak about their historical works. Whereas they might have forgotten those histories and archives pulled them up. I think the contentious point is, what about those artists who don't have archives? We all don't have the wherewithal to collect stuff, right? Sometimes you have to change homes. Sometimes artists have had to, or everyone has had to, leave behind things because they can't carry them. What happens to the archive then? That's really a whole different level of challenge. That does one only speculate in archive, or does one fill in that archive with something else, or does that remain an empty vacuum in history? Needn't remain an empty vacuum in history. And subaltern studies and all of these have really changed the very contours and definitions of the archive by including, say, oral culture, <coughs> folk songs, all of these being bears of memory in which certain forms of collective narrative might be encoded. So then you find ways of expanding even the very content of the archive so that it can tell more stories. So at the end of the day, the archive is always those splits. The splits not just within one narrative, splitting into multiple, but also the split from reality. The archive is only a fragment of things bygone. Right? So those fragments can be, are pieces of puzzles that can be puzzled in multiple ways, which, which is not to say you just play with them, but you can do multiple things. You can play with them rigorously or just frivolously. Um, how do you, uh, where do you draw the line between uh, rebellion in, when it comes to art? Because in this, uh, in the Shanghai Biennale when you just showed, a lot of works, uh, a lot of works were about uh, rebellion and you know going against the system. And it's China, right? So, like, or even in India, how do you, uh, like, how, when you're the curator, when you're the artist, where do you draw the line that you know this is not a political movement? This is just. An no, it's interesting you put this. You know, we did not name any sort of political. What is that? That's the answer. That's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> that, it's a bat. Yeah, that's the answer. <laughs> The dark night speaking or something. No, so um, in fact, we were very sure not. Even when I was talking about rebellion here, it was not about political rebellions or revolts of that kind. It was actually a revolt of even inorganic entities, because that is what is happening around us. Information, history is rebelling against its own mediums, right? So we are yes, let it quiet down. Something really disturbed it. So, so we were not looking at foregrounding. <laughs> See, this is rebellion. We are looking at this. No, I'm serious. I'm not kidding. This is the kind of thing. What does one do with this happening in our environment? In a built environment, a bad sound interrupts a conversation. And this is a question that maybe early, early 20th century, late 19th century, asked when they were building buildings to say, that's noise that has to be kept out. Let's destroy it or let's shut it off, right? Maybe today's answer is something else because we're thinking about open architecture. So we're thinking about forms, we're thinking about life intermingling into each other. And that's really what we were concerned with. We were concerned with those noises that interrupt us. And that's the rebellion we're talking about. How does one, how does one sort of respond to that? Does one shut it off or is the whole of modern we try to do? Or close it off, kill it. Trample over it, or are there other ways to think about it? And I think the fact that we are not hyper disturbed and shutting windows right now is because we come to terms with this, this other, these other rebellions happening amidst us. Yeah, does that sort of answer your question? So if we were not looking at mobilizing political revolts in China 
show the history of rebellion. That was not at all the intention. It was literally these type of things. Or the dance of the universe in a room. These are the kind of things that we're looking at. I think it's satisfying. It is satisfying. Wow. What do you think are the preconditions for uh, meaning making? Wow, these are, <laughs> these are questions we should all be asking ourselves. Uh, preconditions or conditions? Yeah, rather, do you think there should be preconditions for meaning making? Well, a precondition, one precondition would be our openness to be collectively meaning making. Is that what I would answer it? Being open to what sorts of meaning making we are, we would welcome. Uh, would we allow that to be a meaning-making thing in this discussion? We just sort of did, right? So I suppose being meaning, being open to meaning-making is the precondition. And then what devices, what methods, what disciplines you use, is, is what the, those conditions will be. Okay. Does that sort of answer you? And did you have an answer to this? No, it came out of something else. The thing is that uh, there's so much over narrativization of any kind of art, no? uh, so you end up finding something to talk about it. So isn't isn't narrativization anyways a condition of life? We we need to put ourselves in perspective by narrativizing ourselves, and then the narrativizing of art sorts of becomes graded. You know, Vina Das talks about it very beautifully. Then she talks about graded voices. We start grading other narratives in us, kind of like we grading and stuff. So what kind of gradings are we open to? What kind of gradings do we want to? If they want to incorporate. And I'm going to give a talk, which is why I narrative things. In the exhibition, what was interesting as a strategy we were very conscious of was we had very little text. We had people just moving around, figuring things out. And we were not angsty about are people going to get it or not. We were practically saying that, you know, a lot of stuff happening around us even we don't get. Artists are trying to explore it just the way scientists are trying to explore it, and the fact of the matter is, even scientists are not able to get it. So, as all of us are trying to figure out what's going on, um, some of these were sort of provocations to just heighten that question. How do we imagine the universe in a room? Think it's up, up. And so, usually there is a lot of this thing, and the artists, you know, what's all this happening, over intellectualizing? Well, no one's imposing it on you. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to. Right? And no, if you don't want to hear it, you're probably not hearing it. Um, if you do want to be part of that conversation, you're always welcome. Uh, about those sickles uh, yes. and this, uh, what we call as narratives, because uh, many times a story like that, which is so complex, yes. requires an explanation. Yes. Otherwise, people would not get it. Yes. How can you know, I mean, uh, letting it just uh, unexplained to make it so, read the purpose. Good question. So a catalog has a little more information, but again, we didn't over it. Why? It isn't upon just this exhibition to explain the Ayankari movement. We're sort of giving one window into it. Hopefully, people are curious. They would go to the books that have been written and the multiple books that have been written. So we're seeing all of these assemblages of knowledge, right? And so this is obviously one sort of window into it, which is not to tell you with this, I will tell you the history of the Ayankabadi movement. Those who might not have even heard of it might just be provoked by this for the first time now start looking for it online or in books. So for art to be doing all of those things, I don't feel is a necessity. Um, just like is a scientific experiment telling you the history of all its materials and all its tools in that scientific experiment? Is it telling you the history of the test tube in the kind of fluid or chemical experiments it's doing? Probably not, right? Because there will be politics and meanings to also the great contractions that are showing them. At that moment, it's giving an entry point. It will allow you to sort of pick up on threads that you could um, pursue. I mean, one thing for sure, still in response to this is, how do we not trivialize it? I think that is also where your question is coming from. Yes. Not only how to show it fully, yeah, what if it gets misunderstood? Well, um, one does one's best to at least capture all of those things, but uh, capture all this, those different sort of elements and um, so, the sort of um, metaphors 
and bringing a shadow and all of these things into the world and finds ways to express them in other places. But the fact of the matter always remains that there's no way you can stop misunderstanding. Um, there will be misunderstandings by this as much as there will be misunderstanding by things that are completely well explained. So that space of semantics, I think, is always open, even if it's all explained to you. No? So has art opened up something that will at least allow you an entry point is at least one way to go about it. We were careful not to trivialize it. I mean, a work like this, our discussion went on to, should we create a forest out of this? An entire set of like 100 trees of the same kind. Instead of using one tree, this was a, this was a big decision we had to take, that are we going to make it a 50 feet, 50 by 50 or something, forest with these trees with sickles? And then we thought it will, that might actually trivialize it by making it look like an amusement park, people going in, selfies. This just intensified it in such a singular sort of a, a gesture, right? That people would go and think, like see there's something, there's something very specific going on here. Not an amusement park entry into a nice forest of signals, which could have been misinterpreted. And maybe that could have been a direction that would have effectively worked in another space. We knew that it wouldn't work in this space. So. I hope that kind of answer. Hi, this is Sukhdeva. Here, 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 Arts, uh, 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 very sharp mm -hmm. I mean, my feeling, this could be a big discussion, but my feeling is even early 20th century, all those impressionists, they were trying to make themselves understood in society. And the fact of the matter is, a lot of them were themselves not always writing about their art. They, uh, what's his name? Vincent Van Gogh was writing to his brother, trying to explain what he's trying to do. So he was really going through this angst that no one's willing to understand what he does. I need to tell this to someone, right? So he would be telling his brother and then all those books got published and then many scholars came back and, you know, reinterpreted works and stuff like that. Um, in present times, I think there's a, there's a, there's a sort of um, a refusal or wariness to lock meaning, to fix meaning. You don't want to fix it in one meaning. Most artists you meet do not want their work to be seen only as this one-line statement. Just as even those impressionists did not want to be seen as just a one-line statement about what their work is, right? It was doing many things, and they were also figuring it out in making it. So I think contemporary artists are also sort of, uh, well, a number of them are, as while they're as much interested in explaining to people what they do, they're also not, they also vary the fact that they don't want to lock meaning that this is what it means. And so it leaves this open space for us to actually attribute meaning and figure out things in conversation with each other or with them. I think uh, because, because many outsiders in the exhibition and also, and also uh, like Regina or Kuali, Many collection of works. Yes. And then there were these kind of One. single instances. So I think the 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 uh, the exhibition was also trying to kind of uh, you know uh, was trying to kind of uh, kind of uh, interrogate the, uh, the the usual gallery format. You know, when you pick artwork from an artist and show, and then you have somebody explaining it, you know, the, the gallery format. I think the exhibition, I mean, the artist, artist is kind of living a life, and you are peeping into that life to kind of, to kind of, you know, uh, to kind of, uh, uh, to kind of, uh, so. Yeah, to, to kind of learn a bit more, to have a conversation, to engage, to kind of see what the artist is trying to see or do what, you know, to kind of 
So the, 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 the dance of the universe is a beautiful uh, you know, project or even all of them. So I think in the, in the format of the exhibition, there was, there was, there was very clear consciousness that, that yeah. regarding the explanating, explanating yeah. aspect of so the photo yeah. The explanation was to be done through the artwork and through the ensemble. You know, I'm so glad you mentioned this because this is, I'm, I'm so, so glad you mentioned this. So in fact, like I talked about this work, there were a number of works I talked about individually, but really how this exhibition making process went about was not just what this meaning is by itself, what meaning gets produced with this is with this and with this and two other works from uh, Zimbabwe and Somalia on this side. What kind of meanings get produced not in, through individual works because this is this is a tragedy of a lot of certain kinds of exhibitionary formats which individualize each work as being a carrier of its own meaning just like all of our interactions make our relationships different the way i relate to someone else makes me a different person right i am at home someone slightly different from what i am with you so if i am not constant why are the, why are works going to be constant carriers of the same meaning right and so uh, as Prasad said, we were really creating an environments where assemblages or ensembles would create meaning or experiences rather than individual works. So that's why you actually don't even see the usual booth by booth format or one work next to one work format. The sound of this is permeating into this, into this whole space. The tree is casting a shadow that sort of points towards a work which is interactive um, and you have to you have to touch the railway line which was bought from Alibaba in China. You can buy railway tracks from the equivalent of Flipkart. You can buy actual railway tracks from, from Alibaba in, in Shanghai. And, so, and those are the kind of railway tracks that are being exported to various parts of Africa. So these are the kind of realities we wanted to bring into the exhibition to form meaning in, and experiences in this sort of ensemble. So I'm so glad, Prasad. Uh, thank you. Yeah. One of the interesting things about um, the the exhibition was that along with this, the practice, um, the, the, the artists that were selected were these kind of people who were engaging with a long durée practice. Yeah. Right? They weren't one-off works, Correct. but part of a longer journey that artists took. But I think what was also interesting to see and it was really heartening to see was the audience. Yeah. And they were like these long lines of people yeah. waiting to get in. But also the amount of time they spent. So in the sense that they were not people who kind of waited, you know, read like these little notes and then very quickly moved to something else, but spent hours actually in that place, really trying to understand their own narrative. So kind of trying to get their own things out of the uh, exhibition. I think that was something that was really heartening to see in this the practice of both the artist, but the practice of practice of the exhibition goer. So I think that is something that is important again uh, to answer the yeah, question. Sure. Exactly. Yes. Oh. yes, absolutely. Uh, just an extension of what, what Prasad and Rupali were saying. So so uh, here the curatorship uh, was was uh, or, or the whole ensemble itself was also uh, a work of art in that sense. Was it in sense of you know keeping it open for for uh, you know being read as uh, you know uh, as uh, as talking to each other uh, good question i think this is what good curation can do it can create its own environments and i think we were also conscious of the fact that um, when you enter into this exhibition space you feel like you're entering into another zone now that's what as curation we wanted to do you feel like you're entering into another space of a heightened sort of experience uh, whether we want to call it art, I think that's the role of curation. That's how curation brings in various sorts of elements, and especially artworks, to form this microecology, uh, microenvironment. Um, so whether we would call the curation art, I think not. That's what the role of curation is. And um, it's a thin line, but it is a, it is an important line to me. And so, in fact. It's interesting because Rats Media Connected themselves are artists, but they were very clear that this is not their artwork. And the artists were very clear that um, there's something happening in which they understand that 
the ensemble of meaning, the assemblages that are being produced is a curatorial decision. And many of them needed negotiation. Some went hand in hand that, wow, this is exactly the way we would, we would like to show it to you. Um, yeah. So, I mean, and I said this in class the other day, for me, what was like my big takeaway, I've been working in archive, which is all about classifying, interpreting things, decoding historical facts to present them today, right? For me, the whole curatorial experience was a recoding, that what curation does is not decode artworks, it recodes them. And so the artwork as an object is not in and of itself complete. In different environments, it will have different meanings. An artwork almost is like an event. In this, as a curation, we brought these works together as meaning bearers to produce a sort of event where meanings are being generated as you experience them. And then when that same work goes somewhere else, it will be a carrier of slightly different meanings. And so to experience it really like an event in that, in that sense. And that's what curation does. So, so curation is a recoding, not a decoding. Not to decode the artist's intention. Recode it. And the artists, I think, enjoyed that too. We were, we were in touch with 92 plus artists, and I think what was most taxing, but also the most inspiring, was this non-stop conversation we were having with so many of them, not just logistically, but conceptually. And, and I think that was the most enriching thing for all of us, that, that we all worked together on this. So, uh, in the beginning of the show, none of these collections that the artists were sort of making for themselves, which had objects, different things that they collected from, which is a travel of theirs. Yes. So, and you said that these things are not technically archives. So, like, my question is, what makes a collection of archives, mm -hmm. the intertechnical sense of the word? Also, if, uh, if you, if you look at archives as these, because every object is an archive in its own way, it is... Which is what they like, started with, they're calling it, everything an archive now. Yeah, it's, it's like it embodies all the situations that lead to its creation. Right. And it's not just space, it's like everything is an archive on its own, and there is no technical definition of it as such. There are archives and say stories which are interpretative truths, almost synonymous, mm -hmm. and are like... Uh, people who archive things, uh, storytellers in a way. And does archive have any, uh, say, objective responsibility of like truth bearing? Or is it just, uh, is the responsibility of someone who archives just, just to collect these things to allow for access to, for people to interpret their own so Does anyone from the f fifth semester want to come in on this? Um, as we discussed it in class, that everything that is a collection or accumulation of things is not an archive. Right? It's interesting that in today's time, any collection is being called archiving, is being called an archive, right? Technically, that is not the case. Um, technically speaking, archives have been an institution. Those institutions came up hand in hand with museums, with libraries. Why is a museum not an archive? Why is a library not called an archive? Why is only an archive called an archive? There are questions to ask. Why isn't your, why aren't we using the term museum onto the collection of things? Because museums are also a collection of objects and histories and past and stories. Right? Why aren't we calling my, my bed sheet an archive of my postures of sleeping? We may call it the archive of postures of sleeping. Why don't we call it a museum of parasites that have inhabited it? Right? We don't, we, don't, we don't seem that flexible with the term museum and library. So something has obviously shifted drastically with the term archive. And I think it's basically these te technologies of storage that allow photographs and documents and books to be stored. And that's why we suddenly started calling everything archive. But technically speaking, everything isn't an archive. An archive is different from a museum because museums collect objects and archives collect documents of those objects. So in class we were discussing, I don't want to repeat the whole thing, but in a very simple sense, the technical thing for me would be, for instance, if you have a corpus a chair, that chair belongs where? The museum. The library will contain what? A book which features or mentions this chair. That book is not in the museum, right? That book can be in the museum, but it actually also belongs, it mainly belongs in the library. Right? So the book which features the chair is in the library, the chair is in the museum, the archive contains the documents of the making of the chair, of the buying of the chair, of the buying of the wood, all those documents related to the chair. 
It is not the chair itself, right? technically speaking. Now, in today's time, everything is an archive. It's a welcome change because I think these changes came for, for political reasons, not just for technical reasons. Because the archive as a rule applied so strongly to so many histories and that many histories were kept out. And so in order for people to fight for those histories, they had to, they had to put up this struggle to say, your rules of only having documents are not right. What about those cultures that don't create our times, that don't have documents? And so sounds started coming in. So all sorts of other things started coming in, right? It's like Professor Susie Tharu's anthology of women writing in India. There's usually, or South Asia, there's very little texts that are available. That's because the notion of public text, uh, published text is so limited. She had to redefine the contours of the boundaries of literature to include diaries and letters so that an anthology of women writing in India could be made to say this is the form it takes, right? So then, is it about objectiveness? At one point it was. And that's the, that's the power and politics it enforced upon us by telling us only those things that we can research through documents will write the histories. And now when the documents have expanded into so many formats, we can write multiple histories and also multiple lives. And then you also realize that actually it's all properly alive. And maybe some of it is true. And, uh, so that's a whole different question. So technically, I wouldn't call every collection an archive. My grandmother is not an archive. My bed sheet also is an archive. I think on the note of archive, I would like to kind of um, um, open up our archive, Whoa. which we have uh, created. So uh, we are actually kind of uh, um, uh, officially launching uh, uh, a poster of buildings of Bombay that uh, that the uh, students uh, have documented. Uh, I'll just uh, ask my friend to uh, take this ahead, and I'll ask. I'll uh, like to invite Rupali, please come. I I did not sign up for this. <laughs> I thought no, we it. are just taking the opportunity to have a have someone who is so closely working with our guys to kind of open this up for us. I would also like the uh, the uh, present fourth year students uh, who kind of worked on the poster to join uh, for opening the archive, uh, opening the, the poster. And uh, sorry if you could help me, uh, help me open the open. This is uh, basically a, a poster of uh, 20 modern buildings of uh, Bombay. Um, uh, which was put together as a part of the history theory uh, module last last year. Uh, it was uh, an attempt to kind of bring together a modern buildings in Bombay, which are often kind of less spoken about. Uh, and this poster becomes a kind of collectible um, um, uh, and a kind of growing uh, repository of uh, big landscape in the city. So, yeah. That's the Mumbai Modern, a collection of 20 modern buildings um, in the city of Bombay. And uh, uh, it's available. Uh, you can actually, if, you, if you're interested in uh, kind of getting one for yourself, you can collect it from us. Uh, you can uh, uh, order it uh, online through our website. We have put up the link. And uh, uh, it's also available at uh, with our library. Yeah. Uh, so here is a copy for you. Ah, 
And uh, so I have to say that Sabi has been conducting a uh, module on history of art uh, over the last week here and as a part of the module uh, students have kind of put together uh, an exhibition of, uh, and as a result of, uh, uh, of the work. So would you like to kind of briefly introduce uh, to the uh, work and, so, and kind of ask people? Yeah, it is okay. I'm oh. I was going to introduce you guys. Okay, go. <laughs> yes, okay, good. Good idea. Good thinking. No, so, uh, I've, been, I've been invited by uh, the school very kindly to, to conduct this course on art history. And I think we basically just muddled up a lot of art history and we just shuffled it all up to think about it very differently. And in the course of these five days, we've been looking at a lot of art. <coughs> the way it's been thought about, everything from prehistoric times to present day. And then we realized actually it's not a history of art, it's about something else. And then so over time we've been thinking about how history is also a bit like a feedback loop, maybe, creating its own distortions. And so what you're going to see downstairs is 10 groups of students who uh, put together their own encounters, their own ways of understanding, exploring feedback, feedback loops, distortion, the way things loop into each other and then settle and then distort again. So you're more than welcome to seeing uh, the exhibition title Interference. That's what it's titled. Um, I'm, I'm really kicked and proud that these guys put it up together in four days. It's a fantastic job. I was talking about infracuration of how to, how to bring other practices into a curatorial format, into a curatorial sort of thinking. And it feels like a sort of Infra curation that just happened downstairs. And so please do welcome. Um, share your thoughts with old students because they have a lot to say. I'm sure you have a lot to say. Yeah. That no. Uh, downstairs. Yeah. It's here. Oh, it's on oh, we're on the same floor. You don't even have to go down there. So right across. Guys, feel free to go. And uh, thank you. Thank you all.